Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sheila Crane. I'm currently the chair of the Architectural History Department here at um, the University of Virginia. Um, Amber Wiley's talk this evening is a kind of co-production of the Historic Preservation Program and Architectural History. So my colleague Andy Johnston, the Director of Historic Preservation, is going to start things up for us. Great. Thank you, Sheila. We have the pleasure this evening of presenting the fall 2020 Kelly Tucky Endowed Lecture in Historic Preservation. This endowment dedicated to advancing scholarship in historic preservation provides us with the ability to present events in which we engage with contemporary themes in heritage studies. This evening's talk is co-sponsored by the Kelly Tucky Endowment and the Department of Architectural History. So now we'll turn this back to Sheila Crane for introduction of tonight's speaker. So it is really an honor to welcome Dr. Amber Wiley back to the School of Architecture and to the University of Virginia, where she received the Master of Architectural History degree and certificate in historic preservation in 2005. Um, and the thesis that she completed at UVA um, which I can even hold up as an object lesson, <laughs> um, which was entitled Meridian Hill Malcolm X Park, The Life and Struggles of an Urban Cultural Landscape, opened a series of questions about the relationship between large scale processes of urban planning and the uses and meanings residents attach to place, as well as the importance of rethinking the contested nature of cultural heritage and cultural memory, issues that have continued to shape her ongoing research. After leaving UVA, uh, Dr. Wiley received her PhD in American Studies at Georgetown University and then taught at the School of, in the School of Architecture at Tulane University and at Skidmore College. Currently, um, she's assistant professor in the Department of Art History at Rutgers University where she teaches a wide range of courses from those examining the history of Washington DC, um, central to um, Amber's work, documenting landscapes of slavery, um, and also investigations of African American art. I understand some of her students from that class may be with us tonight, so welcome to you. Um, and a really a class that I would love to take on the city and cinema. In 2016, Amber Wiley was named an emergent scholar by Diverse Issues in Higher Education magazine. And amongst the numerous additional awards and fellowships that Dr. Wiley has received, it's worth underscoring that she was the inaugural recipient of the H. Allen Brooks Traveling Fellowship from the Society of Architectural Historians in 2013, which to my mind at least is something like the MacArthur Genius Prize for recent graduates and emerging scholars in architecture and architectural history. Um, the Brooks Traveling Fellowship allowed Amber Wiley to spend a year traveling the world, experiencing a mind boggling array of cities and sites with an eye to preservation practices internationally. And many of us had the pleasure of living vicariously as we awaited the regular updates Amber posted during her travels. Through those experiences and her continuing research, Dr. Wiley brings a unique global perspective to both her teaching and her research, evident perhaps most recently in her essay, Firmitas Utilitas Profectus, The Architecture of Exploitation in Ghana, which is forthcoming in the Architectural Guide to Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. Amber Wiley has published widely, including her essay in Buildings and Landscapes, The Dunbar High School Dilemma, Architecture, Power, and African-American Cultural Heritage, which was the winner of the 2014 Catherine Bashir Prize, and recently was republished in Giving Preservation a History. Other notable publications, and here I'm just selecting a few, include Geography, Planning, and Performing Mobility in New Orleans, which was published in the collection Walking, Walking in Cities in 2016, and her really important 2015 essay, Schools and Prisons, that was published as part of the Aggregate Architectural History Collaborative's Black Lives Matter dossier. She is currently finishing a book, which we are all eagerly awaiting, 
entitled Concrete Solutions, Architecture, Activism, and Black Power in the Nation's Capital, which will be published by the University of Pittsburgh Press in their Outstanding Culture, Politics, and Built Environment series. Dr. Wiley's remarkably broad ranging and collaborative work also includes contributions to important exhibitions, including community policing in the nation's capital, the pilot district project 1968 to 1973, an exhibition that opened at the National Building Museum in March 2018 and offered an incredibly timely and thoughtful exploration of this important experiment in community policing. She's been equally generous in her engagement with public history, historic preservation, and cultural landscape interpretation. From leading a community history project in 2013, focused on Bayou Road in New Orleans, an area of the city distinguished for the number of businesses owned by Black women there, to more recently, her ongoing participation in the New Jersey Revolution Project, spearheaded by Monument Lab, an initiative exploring the multiple genealogies of the American Revolution, including the legacies of indigenous and African-American narratives and experiences, as well as the relationships of those historical events to contemporary revolutionary moments. And I'd like to extend a real thank you to Amber for sharing some of her career trajectory and her insights and experiences with our students today, earlier today and for her really active engagement with the A School community during our listening sessions over the course of the summer. So please join me in extending a warm, if virtual, welcome to Amber Wiley, whose presentation this evening is entitled On Standards and Integrity. Well, OK. Thank you, Sheila, for that amazing introduction. It was kind of fun because I actually was like, yes, I did go to these places and do these things. When you're stuck in the house for, you know, eight some odd months, it's, it's hard to remember that you've actually done things in life besides being in your house. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. That, that was really wonderful. Um, I just, one quick correction, because this always happens, even my family does this. I went to George Washington University, not Georgetown University, but I promise you, you're not the only one. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> you're not the only one. My, my family does it too. Um, and also just wanted to add that Daniel Wilkins, another UVA grad, was uh, another H. Allen Brooks scholar. So UVA might actually have a monopoly on that right now. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And just wanted to thank you all again for having me um, because this is really a homecoming. It's the second time I've talked to folks at UVA in the last three years. I, I was on a landscape architecture panel back in 2018. And that was a really important conversation around landscapes of, of future publics. So today I'm going to be talking about standards and integrity. And I also added a, I don't want to call it a subheading, but material and memory, really connecting my experience with the built environment to the ways that I look at architecture, but not just from a personal standpoint in terms of like inclusion or diversity, but in terms of the rigor with which I examine landscapes. So this is a slide that shows a quote from John Hope Franklin, an Oklahoma uh, born American historian. And it's in the National Museum of African American Heritage in uh, History and Culture in Washington, DC. In the quote, he says, we've got to tell the unvarnished truth. And that's what I hope to be doing this evening. So about two weeks ago, I had the pleasure of sitting in on the NOMA National Conference. The virtual conference was supposed to be in Oakland, but as we all know, that didn't happen. But there was a liveliness and camaraderie that was felt uh, throughout the days that the, conversation, uh, the conference was on. And for those who don't know, NOMA means the National Organization of Minority Architects. And one of the keynote panels was called Unbuilding Racism. 
And I couldn't even remember who said this, but I heard the quote when I was sitting there, unbuilding racism is essential work. And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, it is. It's essential in the fact that we have to move through it and go through it. But it's also essential in the fact that it puts the people who are doing the work in precarious situations, as we see, you know, the way that we think about our essential workers today. Um, and so I'm going to read a little bit from some remarks I prepared just to keep me on track because I can go off track. Black people historically have been underrepresented in academia and predominantly white institutions, and even sometimes on the faculty of historically black colleges and universities. They've had to do the heavy lifting, the work that pushes institutions forward into the modern era. They're the ones who are sitting on a task force, having meetings with students, supporting students, faculty and staff of color, acting, as ghostwriters for statements on Black Lives Matter. I, I was a ghostwriter on a couple of these, y'all never knew, but I'd put in that work too, just uncredited. Uh, challenging outdated and irrelevant approaches to curriculum content and pedagogy, demanding that their colleagues listen to them and take them seriously, being the subject of aggressions, micro or otherwise. Um, they suffer often from pay in inequality, longer work hours to prove their worth, and even then, sometimes that work goes unnoticed by traditional academic standards for tenure and promotion. It's the work that the institutions, and I'm talking about all institutions, want to put on their front page, but it's the kind of work that's rarely compensated for those who are on the front lines. Uh, the students who are in my African-American art class know this image well. Where, when and where I enter the British Museum by Carrie Mae Weems, I saw this image when I was still working at Skidmore and I was part of a diversity initiative there to highlight um, diverse Black artists in the museum collection, the Tang Collecting Museum at Skidmore. And I saw that image and it spoke to me in the deepest ways as someone who had been to the British Museum as a black woman and you know, walked through the collections and, and thought of the holdings within the British Museum, not just as kind of an exploration of the history of the world, but also a monument to imperialism and colonialism. You know, and it it really I felt very conflicted about my presence there because on the one hand, I loved that I was able to see, you know, uh, Syrian, Assyrian lions that guarded gates of ancient cities and pharaohs and mummies and great Greek classical sculpture all in the same place. But I also knew that it didn't quite feel right. So, the title of this piece is a nod back to Anna Julia Cooper's statement in her seminal work, A Voice from the South. I'm gonna throw that word seminal out of my lexicon soon. But um, Julia, sa Julia says, Julia Cooper says, only the black woman can say when and where I enter in the quiet undisputed dignity of my womanhood without violence and without suing or special patronage, then and there the whole Negro race enters with me. Uh, Paula Giddings also wrote a book called When and Where I Enter that focuses on the experience of Black American women in the United States of America. And so she's also taking a nod to Anna Julia Cooper. I would update this particular statement and say that when and where I enter as a Black woman then the whole human race enters with me. So expanding that conversation from, you know, just an issue about black womanhood within the race, but humanity um, in the larger constructs that we operate in. So I'm going to say a, another quote that's actually coming from Sadia Hartman. And it's from an interview that she did this summer with Art Forum in 2020. And she says, we, and she's speaking about black femmes, have been assigned a place in the racial capitalist order, which is the bottom rung. 
The bottom rung is the place of the quote unquote essential worker, the place where all onerous reproductive labor occurs. This is the reproductive work that nurtures and supports the psychic life of whiteness that shores up the inviolability, security, happiness, and sovereignty of that master subject of man. And I really found that work to be poignant too in thinking about my relationship with the academy, but also the ways in which Black women, BIPOC people, um, folks within the LGBTQ spectrum enter into academia or into even the practice of architecture, which is really a field that was not meant for them. And, and thinking about the kinds of damage and violence that happens, but also that hard work that they put in to reimagine what these places could be. So I'm gonna do a little personal segue and I wondered if I should even go there, but I am because it gives you all a little entrance into how I ended up thinking about the built environment and especially my relationship to the historic preservation field. And so I'm calling this material and memory because I no longer have the material. It's just the memory that remains in the material. I mean, the places that I'll be speaking about in just a second. So this image is from 516 Market Street, Muskogee, Oklahoma. It is the home of my father who graduated from Muskogee High School in 1969, the year Oki from Muskogee actually came out. Um, and it was in the historically black section of Muskogee, close to the only black high school, manual training high school, which is where he graduated and remained the home base for the Wiley family in Muskogee. This is my brother, my cousins, myself, and another cousin on the front porch. Another image on the front porch of my parents, Clarence and Denise, and two uncles. My parents actually met at Brown University. And the reason that they even um, were able to meet at Brown is because there was a student sit-in December 1968, the same year that Martin Luther King was assassinated. Well, actually it was in the sit-in, it was a walkout where 65 of the 85 black students at Brown and at sister college Pembroke walked out of classes and basically took over a church at the bottom of the hill in Providence and asked demands of the president specifically to increase the enrollment of black students at Brown University uh, to 11%. They were currently at 2%. And they said, you need to increase the, 11, uh, the student population, the black student population um, by 11%, which the school did the following fall. In doing so, they plucked black students out from all over the country. And so that's how a country boy from Muskogee and a city girl from Washington, DC ended up at Brown in the fall of 1969. So I told the students who I spoke with earlier in the day, <laughs> your activism does matter because if it were not for that walkout, I, I wouldn't be here like on, on the molecular level, right? Um, so anyhow, these are my parents at 516 Market Street in Muskogee. Some cousins playing around, my aunt walking in the background. What really stood out to me in this image that I found as I was going through my collections is the slight decline in the hill. You see it there. Right now we're facing Northwest, looking Northwest. Um, in this community that was part of the heart of Black Muskogee. Now we're looking Southeast. This is the same hill. You can see uh, that it's the entrance to Market Street and there's Dillard's at the bottom of it. So if you put in 516 Market Street today, um, 
it'll pull up this image from Google Maps. It's actually a little bit off because um, the home, which I mapped here with a Sanborn map, you can barely see it there, was actually at the curve of this decline. So the street, Market Street, went straight through to the other side. Um, the house was acquired through eminent domain by the Muskogee Urban Renewal Authority who decided that the city needed a mall. And you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, but you showed me the pictures. I was born in 1980. Those pictures were about 83, 84. Yes, urban renewal was still happening in the 80s. This mall opened in 1987. And it is today considered a dead mall, um, struggling even to survive. But it was placed within what was known as the Black Business District of Muskogee, Oklahoma. So the homes were acquired in the early 80s and demolished. Uh, the Wiley Homestead was as well. So this is an image from 1969. It's a map from the National Capital Planning Commission. And what these dots represent is damage, um, property damage, fires, so on and so forth, that um, were recorded in the aftermath of the uprising in Washington, D.C. on April 4th, 1968, which is the day that Martin Luther King was assassinated. So the big brown dots mean uh, destroyed beyond repair. Obviously, the, the soft kind of pinker dots mean liminal situation. Um, the red dots are somewhere in between. This would be 7th Street. This is 14th Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. This little red dot here is the block where my mom lived um, and grew up in Washington, D.C. It's in a neighborhood called Leisure Park. So just a few blocks from the damage that was sustained for the rightful outpouring of rage and anguish that people felt um, in their physical acting upon the environment. My family stayed. So this is my grandmother, aunt and uncle in June of 1968. So you know that April 1968 happened, but they did not leave. They could not leave. There were plenty of people who stayed, who did not abandon the city and who remained steadfast in their neighborhoods. Again, early 80s, I am that cute baby right there. My older brother, grandma and my mom out from of my grandfather's house in Washington, D.C., Lee Joy Park. It's about to get real. Yes, awkward tween years sitting on the porch of my grandfather's house in Washington, D.C. This is the early 90s. By this time, the neighborhood was considered a part of a quote unquote city under siege as the Washington Post put it. Um, and I'm going to go to my notes to just kind of reiterate. Um, actually, I'm going to move forward. Same day. Different view. So the city under siege was a city that had block crews who were considered gangs by the local police, people who represented their different blocks. Howard University was a short walk from my grandfather's house. And it owned a significant number of houses in the neighborhood. And it desired to expand the campus. So they held on to these houses and created a situation of demolition by neglect. They let the ball, buildings fall down all around my grandfather. As you can see in the background, we have a bricked up house. The house beside my grandfather's was abandoned for about almost a decade, it was boarded up. Uh, the roaches would come into my grandfather's house. It was a less than ideal situation. Um, and so this is just to give you an idea of what the neighborhood went through post riots, post people leaving, post uh, disinvestment. And the funny thing about this 
is that even in the middle of this situation, my grandfather would always talk about the glorious history of Leedroit Park. And I was like, what are you talking about, Grandpa? He's like, Mary Church Terrell lived here, right? Paul Lawrence Dunbar lived here. Right down the street was Howard Theater. And I'm sitting on the porch, looking around going, okay, yeah, if you say so, I can't see it in my head. And I certainly can't see it around. But it was the stories that my grandfather told me that kind of began to make me question why. Um, what happened here? Um, you know, why is the neighborhood in such bad shape? Who, who I, I can't, I almost want to say who's to blame, but like what factors um, really mitigated the situation? We still went there. Um, Howard Homecoming 2002, right? The neighborhood was such that I did feel a tinge of embarrassment of actually, you know, bringing my friends there and so on and so forth. But I also felt a sense of pride because I knew that my grandfather stayed when everybody else abandoned the city and abandoned the neighborhood. And he was true to his city and his history. Um, these are some of my sorority sisters um, at Howard. My Siri just decided to like speak to me. She was like, what did you just say? No Siri, no. Oh, stop. Anyhow. So this is an image and someone marked on, I don't even know how to take that mark off. Um, someone marked on, on the PowerPoint. But um, I don't know if any of my tech people know what to do with that because I have no idea. This is an image actually from 2018 with my niece in front of the house where my mother grew up. It looks a little different. The house beside it was um, renovated, rehab flipped around 2004. That's when I started to get worried because I knew if that house flipped, then the neighborhood would probably flip too. Um, so Leedroit Park in the early 2000s and especially in the 2010s was one of the neighborhoods in DC that was the most rapidly gentrified. We actually lost the house around 2006, 2007 because my family took out a second mortgage on it and was unable to pay it back um, and went through foreclosure proceedings. This is while I was getting my PhD at George Washington in architectural history and historic preservation. So you can't imagine the kind of distress one feels knowing that you don't have the capital to push through preservation of your own family home. Um, and so that, you know, this is kind of where I enter into the conversation. These are the types of things that have pushed my research, my scholarship, my policy activism, understanding this lens with which I look at the built environment, in which I look at the capitalist structures that, um, you know, force people to have their homes destroyed for a mall or people losing their homes through second mortgages and neighborhood gentrification. Those are the kinds of things that I know from a personal standpoint. And when they're not addressed in architectural curriculum, preservation curriculum, that's the kind of thing that I try to bring to the conversation. And it's more than just something that's personal or memorable. It's about rigor and inclusivity in a way that is not just diversity for diversity's sake, but clearly points to mechanisms currently enacted within the design field that need to be reckoned with. And so that was actually an intro. Let me see how much time I have. Cool. Um, now I'm gonna tell you about my case studies. So that technically, you know, shapes the way that I think about the built environment, but it also shapes the way I think about the historic preservation practice. So I had the immense pleasure of serving as a member of the National Preservation 
or the National Park System Advisory Board's National Historic Landmark Subcommittee. So there's a board that is an advisory to the National Park System. And then within that board, there is a subcommittee that only looks at National Historic Landmark designations, nominations, or rejections. The National Historic Landmark Program takes up so much time that the advisory board itself can't look at all of the nominations. And so they elect certain people to do that work. And it's during this work that I really came across this notion of what it means to have standards in, in, in integrity um, in the preservation field. So what we did is we reviewed National Historic Landmark nominations uh, we approved them and sent them to our mother board to either, you know, to, well, actually to recommend them to the Park Service, or we rejected them and said, you need to come back here with a little bit more work. By the time nominations came to my committee, uh, they were in good shape, but we were the folks who really pushed uh, the, the folks who were nominating these sites to be the best kind of nomination that it could be. So within my capacity as a member of the National Historic Landmark Committee, I participated in a number of workshops called Multiple Voices. These workshops were sponsored and funded by the Kellogg Foundation and given to the National Park Foundation in an effort to increase the diversity of voices represented in the park systems preservation programs. And so we did deep dives into things like the history of preservation criteria. Where did we come up with this criteria and how we judge these things, right? So that's me at an airport reading my crafting preservation criteria book. Then we did whole workshops, days long workshops going line by line through the National Register Bulletin, which is supposed to tell you how to go about nominating landmarks to update the uh, explanations around the criteria. We didn't mess with the law. There's leg legislation that specifically dictates what National Historic Landmarks are. But what we did do was try to update the way that we talk about these things. Uh, the bulletin was last updated in 1999. I served on the committee from 2014 to 2018. And so we wanted to make sure that, you know, almost 20 years that had passed, we made sure that the uh, examples that were given in our guidebooks about how to prepare these nominations were updated to reflect the kinds of architectural history um, that was really being discussed at the time period. So yes, more vernacular buildings, uh, buildings that represented Asian American Pacific Islander themes that represented women's history, LGBTQ history, and thinking about how to create context for these types of nominations. There was the idea that the National Historic Landmarks Program was elitist, that it was actually really difficult to get a nomination through. And so our job was to make sure that we streamlined the process and you know, gave people real examples of National Historic Landmarks that they can work with from 2016 on. So this is like line by line parsing out what it means long days. Then 2016 happened. So we had a change of administration. The new secretary of the interior was not meeting with our mother board, the National Park System Advisory Board, who we reported out to. The work that we did was kind of lost in the stalemate. So this is, I actually went yesterday, I was like, well, I wonder if they did any updates since, you know, that meetings and everything was canceled. Uh, no. So as you can see here on the National Park Service site, it says this bulletin was released in 1999. It's outdated. Um, 
revision began in 2017. Well, that was three years later. They don't have anything for you. Part of that is due to the fact that once the administration changed and the board above us no longer met, we were left with no agenda. We were left with no way to conduct our meetings. If our board who we report to isn't meeting, then what are we doing? So all that hard work that we put in, uh, all the retreats, all the coffee, all the, the line editing to make this particular program more accessible to a variety of constituencies. I won't say it went down the drain, but I will say it hasn't moved forward. And those are the types of things that happen behind the scenes that folks don't often talk about a report, but it was good work. And, you know, hopefully something will come of it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about two case studies related to this work. One is the Carter G. Woodson National Historic Site and the other is Berry Farm Dwellings. These are two um, historic preservation case studies that I worked on in my capacity as a consultant over and actually a principal instigator over the course of two years. So, the Carter G. Woodson house was the home of Carter G. Woodson, who was um, one of the founders of the Association for the Study of African American Life and Heritage, ASALA. And he's also known as the father of Black history. His home was the place where he conducted business, held meetings, he actually published works from his home. Um, he trained up a new generation of historians who put Black history at the forefront of their work. And I'm actually going to, to read a little bit from this. Um, Wilson was active in civil rights and Black freedom struggles in Washington, D.C. and nationally. He believed that education was central to combating racism and white supremacy and to achieving true freedom as guaranteed in the US Constitution. So Woodson's work was about one, legitimizing the history of African-Americans in the United States of America. Um, and two, to make sure that the United States lived up to all the principles declared in the Constitution and the De Declaration of Independence. So he is actually the person who founded what we now call Black History Month but then it was called Negro History Week. And in his Journal of Negro History, which is uh, an academic scholarly publication that he published out of his home, he talks about the growth of Negro History Week. And he talks about pilgrimages to monuments, which were an important feature of the Negro History Week celebration. And he says, such interest has been manifested in all celebrations of Negro History Week were more, were more pronounced than ever this year, as we have a growing appreciation of the characters in history memorialized in the sacredness of the ground on which they labored for humanity. He talks about places that people went, such as the home of Frederick Douglass, the scenes of the labors of Booker T. Washington, Tuskegee, um, the birthplace of Paul Lawrence Dunbar in Ohio, the Sojourner Truth House, so on and so forth. And he says that people are going to these places because they are monuments, not the least of imposing, but great because they are enshrined in the hearts of the descendants of those generations that these heroes served. So he's saying, yeah, they might not be the most imposing, fabulous structures you've ever seen in your life, but it's not about that. It's about the work that the people did and its resonance with folks who were beneficiaries of that work. His house was created as a National Historic Landmark because of the impetus of two brothers who formed an organization called the Afro-American Bicentennial Corporation. And what they wanted to do was that in 1976, we had our bicentennial celebration, 1776, right, 200 years. 
they believed that representation of African American history and sites were not was not up to par with what it should be, and so they conducted through um, collaboration with the park system an inventory of sites that they deemed eligible to be national historic landmarks, and they created a book about it. In many of the sites that they conducted research on actually became National Historic Landmarks. And so here is one of the brothers, uh, Vincent DeForest, speaking with Senator Edward Brooke and Walter Fontroy um, in Washington, DC. So why was the Woodson House important? Well, first of all, it's important because it's the, the home of Carter G. Woodson. Um, but it was also very personal because it was in close relationship to the place where my mother grew up. And I knew my grandfather passed in 2011. I knew that he would have been proud of the work I was doing in his neighborhood. The Woodson house had been, it suffered from neglect, not through the fact of, you know, kind of the general, general uh, neglect that was seen in Washington, DC, but the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, which owned the building, couldn't keep up uh, with the cost of maintaining the site. And they ended up moving their offices. Their offices had been in that building since 1922, but they moved them in the late 80s um, because of the heavy weight of preservation. My work with the site was updating its nomination form. And I had a co-principal investigator Maria McCurder, who worked with me to do the social history of Carter G. Woodson, while I did the architectural history of the site from before the time that Woodson lived there to present day. So you can see the original nomination around 10 pages, our nomination around 83. It's a little bit of research, just a little bit. Um, and this is just showing the, the difference in the landscape there and the house in red. So from early efforts to stabilize the structure from keeping it from falling down to the extensive renovation that was done by the National Park Service. It actually became a unit of the park system. I chronicled all of that information. And then I tried to put the house into the context of these updated themes that the National Park Service had created, not the ones that I was working on, but these actually predated my time with the program. So I was doing all of this work to make sure that the interpretation matched the, the kind of nuance that we see today with nominations coming forward to the board. So on the one hand, I was on the board and reviewed nominations. And on the other hand, I actually was preparing a nomination. So I knew it from both sides. Granted, this particular site had already received National Historic Landmark status. But my job was to make sure that the narrative was fuller and richer. And so we had to update this particular nomination form with information that was useful for today. And in doing so, we updated the criteria within which we talked about the site. First, we talked about the fact that it was associated with a person of nationally national significance in the US, criterion two. And three, and this was the most contested, and I'm actually gonna have to stop, I can't even talk about Barry Farms, huh? This is the most contested part of our nomination update is that we said that it represented a great idea or ideal of the American people. Now, what are great ideals of the American people? Well, for the most part, the folks with the National Historic Landmark uh, program couldn't quite tell me. But the argument that Maria and I put forward on behalf of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History um, is thus, and I'm going to tell y'all because I wrote it down. So one, the criterion says that the property should be something that represents a great idea or ideal of the American people. And it goes on to say, this represents some overarching concept or image held by the population of the United States 
It could be a general historical belief, principle, or goal. It requires the most, uh, the utmost scrutiny and would apply only in rare instances involving ideas and ideals of the highest order in the history of the United States. So our argument was that Carter G. Woodson's work as an educator actually, okay, I'm gonna get the exact words, I wanna mess this up. From 1922 until his death in 1950, Woodson, who was active, and I said this before, in the civil rights and black freedom struggles, believed that education was central to combating racism and white supremacy and to achieving true freedom as guaranteed by the US Constitution. So what our argument was, is that Woodson's work laid the foundation for civil rights legislation in history that would come before um, or that would come after it. Um, and that without the kind of work that he did, what was supposedly um, emblematic of the democracy of the United States, these freedoms that we secured would never ring true. The constitution means nothing if it doesn't underline equality for all citizens of the United States. The Declaration of Independence doesn't mean anything for people who were formerly enslaved. And so the argument that we put forth is that Woodson's ideal of the humanity of black people <laughs> um, is actually the thing that brought us to where we are today. The thing that helped lay the groundwork and the foundation for um, the civil rights era. And that, again, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and all these things wouldn't mean anything at all if not for the kind of work that Woodson was doing. When I tell you we got tremendous pushback, we got tremendous pushback from the Park Service. They were like, mm, I can't see it. And we were like, no, no, no. <laughs> this is what this means. This is, this is what Woodson himself said. He said that we cannot you know, celebrate these kinds of documents, right? If we don't acknowledge the wrongs that were done in history, but also acknowledge the kind of gains that black people made and how they worked to push us to really embody what those principles stood for. Um, these are all images of, of sites that also quote unquote, held a, a great idea or ideal of the American people. Brown Chapel AME, which is where a lot of meetings were held in Selma during the civil rights movement. Freedom Tower, where Cuban ref refugees um, came and were processed in Miami. And then even the bulletin that I talked about before mentions the Liberty Bell. And I was like, the Liberty Bell means nothing if not for the work of Woodson and the civil rights movement, right? Um, and so it was really interesting having this dialogue with the Park Service staff who didn't really want to have to say that that's what it was. Um, that, that Woodson's work really played this kind of role. Um, they wanted to talk about really the greatness of America without really talking about how you get there. And so that was a major kind of issue that I face in this particular situation. I've got a little quote for you all, and I'm sorry, folks, I'm not going to talk about Berry Farm. I could talk about that more in the question and answer. Um, I've got a little quote that I found from an oral history from the Park Service as I was looking for information about the Afro-American Bicentennial Corporation and the DeForest Brothers and their work in um, broadening the scope of the National Historic Landmark Program. And so I found an oral history interview with Robert Utley, who was the chief historian of the Park Service and also um, the head of the NHL program for quite a while. And someone says, well, how do you feel about these landmarks that came into being in the 1970s? 
and Bob says, I believe that a lot of these so-called black landmarks that Ed and others believe were improperly inflicted on the park service. Well, he's talking about, um, he's actually talking about whether or not they met the standards for inclusion as a national historic landmark. They should have never been classified and I don't believe they would have if I was there because I related to those LaForest brothers in ways that my successors did not. And I think I could have restrained their excesses in ways that my successors did not in terms of unacceptable black landmarks. And unacceptable in terms of how they define uh, the standards of criteria and integrity. Um, and so he's talking about what he sees as tension between trying to broaden the scope of the National Historic Landmark Program, but also not to quote unquote, lower these standards, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's funny to me because when I found this oral history from, you know, what, 11 years after the, the Woodson House was declared a National Historic Landmark, I said that kind of pushback that conversation, that dialogue around substandard sites, that's the same stuff we're dealing with today. And it's, it's, um, it's kind of wild how it happens in cycles like this, or maybe it never, it hasn't changed. But that's the kind of the issues that we deal with when trying to talk about historic preservation and the relationship of Black history to that. So here are a few images of the Whitson House in 1979 when it's documented by the Historical American Building Survey. And again, in 2019, when I was doing uh, the research for updating its nomination. Again, the update wouldn't affect whether or not the site would be a National Historic Landmark. It was always going to be that. But what it did do was broaden through research the conversation around how we interpret the significance of Whitson and how the park service tells that story. Um, and so that was really what was at stake in this particular situation. And yeah, so I totally ran out of time, but I do wanna leave us with one quote in thinking about these ideas of standards and integrity, although I didn't get to talk about the, the berry farm integrity issue. So I, I was convening some, some reading time with, with my sisters, Audrey Lord and Gail Hooks and Zadia Hartman and all that. So Audrey Lord in her Sister Outsider talks about a lot of things, but here's one quote that I, I wanna leave with you all. She talks about racism, sexism, heterosexism and homophobia as forms of human blindness that stem from the same root, an abil inability to recognize the notion of difference as a dynamic human force, one which is enriching rather than threatening to the defined self when there are shared goals. Um, one other quote that I actually have, again, from Audre Lorde, Few scholars theorize the Black experience from a standpoint that centralizes the perspective of poor and working class folks. Yet to ignore this standpoint is to reproduce a body of work that is neo-colonial insofar as it is violent. This kind of work of ignoring um, the experience, the Black experience, the experience of poor and working class people erases and destroys those subjugated knowledges that can only erupt, disrupt, and serve as acts of resistance if they are visible and remembered. Documentation of a cultural genealogy of resistance invites the making of theory that highlights the cultural practices, which transforms way of, ways of looking and being in a manner that resists reinscription by prevailing structures of domination. That was actually from Bell Hooks. And you know, when I think about the things that they're talking about, they say black experience is valid, it's validated. Um, ignoring that experience is ignoring new theories that can emerge. And you know, something that I've I've struggled with 
And one of the reasons why I even included that kind of biographical point in the beginning is that when you're talking about diversity, when you're talking about inclusion, it's not enough to give multiple voices a microphone. Um, again, I was working in this multiple voices framework for the National Historic Landmark System. Don't just listen. Listen to the new knowledge that is being produced, the ideas that are being put forth, because it's not just about emotions and experiences. It's about making your inquiries more rigorous. It's about challenging the dominant narrative. It's about creating new theory that can be transformed into practice. Uh, that's some of the work that we did with the Carter G. Whitson House. It's a lot of what we did with the Berry Farms dwelling. And it's, it's really important to keep that in mind, that it's not just about an experience. Um, it's about the material, the memory, and how it works with, transforms, or expands our notions of what is a standard and how we define integrity. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. I'm hoping that you might take some questions from the audience. Um, so feel free to ask a question in the chat um, or to raise your hand and we will try and. Okay. I help field the questions. Okay. Well, while people are getting warmed up to ask their questions, um, where you ended in sort of thinking about Audre Lorde as a kind of guide for thinking, um, I was thinking, I've been thinking recently a lot about her essay on master's tools, the master's tools won't dismantle the master's house. And I think there's an interesting nudge that you're almost asking us to make that is not wanting to give to just give up on policy and process and to insist on, say, alternative institutional modes of recognition. But could you say more about the challenges maybe of working within and against um, the kinds of institutional standards that you are confronting and maybe the challenges of wanting to bend the master's tools in certain ways as part of the project. Yes. So the funny thing is you don't have to, you don't even have to and yeah, in some ways we can push against the system, but when you look at the policy, and like I said, we spent way too much time <laughs> looking at all this legislation and the interpretation of it, you realize that certain modes of thinking are being prioritized over others. So I didn't get to get into the Berry Farms case study, and I will not go and reiterate that whole thing, but the notion was, this is a public housing project that was nominated for association with a historical event, um, actually a series of historical events um, in the black experience in Washington, DC. And the Historic Preservation Office in Washington, DC actually rejected the nomination and they didn't wanna support it on the grounds of the fact that these public housing buildings had a lack of integrity. And they pointed to specifically, let's see, they pointed to specifically um, these seven standards. These are the standards in which we 
um, judge the integrity of a site if it retains the location, if it has the same setting, what the design is, the materials, the workmanship, the feeling and association. Of all these points, the Historic Preservation Office in Washington, D.C. said that the Berry Farms dwellings did not retain integrity of five of these particular points. Um, I was called in to look at the site and determine that for myself, <laughs> an outside perspective. I went directly to the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Preservation for Historic Buildings, went all through the information about um, what constitutes high integrity for a site. And then I went back and did my own assessment. And I determined that of all the different ways that we can think about integrity, the public housing project actually met five of these seven criteria. Um, they were not built to be materially um, rich, right? This was a public housing project that was created during the World War II era. They had the same location. They had the same setting. They had generally the same design. The preservation office said the design was compromised but it was reversible. And so I said, well, the Secretary of Interior says, if you can reverse the changes, then that's enough for the integrity. Materials and workmanship, they were never meant to be grand buildings. They retained also the feeling and association. Now the preservation office did not want to touch the notion of feeling and association. Um, most architectural historians and preservationists think that this notion of feeling and association is foo-foo, and we should not be discussing it. But the fact of the matter is, we didn't nominate, and I didn't work on the nomination for Berry Farm. Uh, Sarah Schoenfeld from Prologue DC did. But she wasn't nominating it for its architecture and design. The criterion with which she was nominating it was about historical relevance. And for the people who lived in that neighborhood, and for folks in DC who knew the history of Berry Farm, Feeling and association was strong. The location was the same. The setting was the same. The design changes could be reversed. So when you're talking about things that have like a high level of integrity or these types of standards, you have to wonder what exactly people are looking for. A lot of the times, because we're so caught up in the materiality of architecture, folks say things like, well, the materials aren't the same. And it's not a high quality workmanship. Well, public housing projects were never supposed to be that. So to you know, deny historic status based on those facts, it doesn't make any sense, especially if we're thinking about the reason why we're nominating the site in the first place. We're not nominating it for that. So that's basically what I said. But, um, <laughs> right? So I, I do wanna push back on that notion like, oh, we're bending the rule. I'm like, no. What, what is happening is that a certain way of doing business has been sustained for 40 some odd years in the preservation field. And the folks who have the ability to talk about things like material and memory feeling and association are just now getting to the plate. And when they see things that, I mean, these, these standards were like applied indiscriminately in, according to like what the criteria was. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. The work that we did for the National Historic Landmarks looked at these exact issues. And people in the Park Service kind of pushed back because they said, well, what am I supposed to do if a source isn't as materially rich as I consider it like it should be? Um, you know, how am I supposed to create preservation standards around feeling and association? I mean, that's really what the con that's really what the conversation is. People are like, I don't even know what to do with this stuff. Like, how, are you gonna make me preserve something off the basis of feelings and association? Like, how how do we how do we begin to address preservation in that way? Um, I think it goes back to this notion of what is tangible and intangible history, um, what community knowledge is. I will say, is this gonna let me out? No, let me out. Um, that whenever I go to that mall in Muskogee 
my aunt goes, it was a tree right there in the backyard, like almost every time. The feelings and association are there, like, and I'm not arguing that we should preserve a community that is no longer extent, but it's a different way of understanding place that isn't even, it's like, it's not going around or lowering standards. It's just that because folks who have these various um, experiences and knowledge, and yeah, I was able to go right to that book about the Secretary of the Interior because I went to UVA and I had to buy it for a class. So I could debunk that notion that Berry Farm was not, you know, didn't have a high level of integrity. I was like, nope, mm -mm, the rules say this. So yeah, it's not, a, you know, I talked about how we look through the legislation and we're interpreting the, the terminology like and all that stuff. We weren't bending the rules. We were just thinking about more rigorous ways in which to apply the criteria. If anything, we were making it more expansive at the same time saying up your ante. Like so many historic sites have been nominated with less rigorous means of analysis than what we were applying. Um, yes. <laughs> so you have a couple good questions in the chat. This is very related to it. Uh, Nikita Reed says, can you talk more about conversations that were had around the ways the National Park Service is trying to reconcile systemic disinvestment in urban and black communities and how a lack of architectural integrity has been used to exclude important sites? And is, NP is the National Park Service considering any changes to the standards? So I think part of that is related to what I, I was just saying about looking at what the legislation says and thinking about how we have applied or applied this criteria in the past versus how we can apply it today. For like the simple fact of the matter is people didn't want to deal with, and I'm talking about preservation technologies, like technology people, they didn't want to deal with building an association because again, they were like, I don't even know. I don't even know how to, like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, you're telling me that people in the community have a long-standing historical memory. How do I turn that into, like, a preservation policy standard? Like, how do I, like, so what's the approach, right? Like, that was a lot of the pushback that we were getting in those conversations. So, yeah, I think part of it is that the Park Service didn't really know, and I guess I can speak specifically about the historic landmark program, how to deal with disinvestment. <laughs> they didn't know, because they're like, that means we'll have to put something back in, right? And I don't know how to do that versus like trying to maintain something that's already there. Um, let's see, and I see Jessica had asked about personal lived experience versus academic experience in, in your work. So I think that you know, when I could pull out the Secretary of the Interior standards, when people are saying, you know, this public housing project holds no degree of integrity, I could say, no, it doesn't, right? So it's, it's the way the, and the preservation office was the city uh, agency that didn't wanna have to deal with, I'm just gonna say, they didn't wanna have to deal with Berry Farms. So they did not support its nomination. The Historic Preservation Review Board is a different entity that actually looks at historic nominations. And eventually after, I mean, years and years of Berry Farm tenants fighting and um, social advocacy groups and uh, historians and community people coming together and saying, hey, this is a significant site. Uh, the Historic Preservation Review Board actually decided to include some of the remaining structures of this public housing project and create a historic district around it. But again, it preservation knowledge, parlance, policy, theory is, it can be very inaccessible and it's that way for a reason. And so, you know, thinking about 
the power of what is not there or the power of memories. And quite frankly, what people in Berry Farm said it was a fear of gentrification. Like they, they said, you know, DC is coming in, tearing down the housing apartment, uh, the housing units to create mixed income, high density projects that are not even a one-to-one -one replacement of the public housing. They, they couch that conversation within the larger conversation of gentrification in DC. And I mean, that's something, you, you know, like I automatically, I was like, oh, know all about that, <laughs> right? So like that's that kind of like personal experience. Like I've seen it happen. I know exactly what you're talking about. And besides the fact that, you know, a lot of people in these communities don't have the capital to maintain ownership of their homes. We're talking about a community of people who live in public housing who don't even have that, right? They don't have ownership of these units. So the city says, you don't even have a claim to this space, right? Which is like insane. Cause they're like, no, this is my home. Like you can't, you know? So um, that's the kind of insight and I guess passion that I, I bring to the work. There's another question that um, from Genevieve Sankula that looks like a matter of clarification. Is it strictly the park department? Are they the ones who are able to revise nominations in order to include, decide what is silenced and what is not? No. <laughs> so in the same way that theoretically any individual can create a National Historic Landmark nomination, theoretically. Um, any individual can propose an updating of the nomination. So in fact, the organization that Carter G. Woodson founded, the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, partnered with the Park Service, got monies from the Park Service uh, because they, like, they didn't even know this was a thing that you can do, and it is a thing you can do. Um, to expand the narrative around Carter G. Woodson's life, right? And to um, place him within conversations of other national historic landmarks like the Mary McLeod Bethune House and the Frederick Douglass House, right? So they wanted to make sure that this was all up to date and relevant. When I was on the National Historic Landmarks Committee, which has finally be re been reconstituted in 2020 after four years of inactivity, um, because we had the multiple voices workshops that you know were founded or were funded through the Kellogg Foundation, we looked at these various case studies and one included the Virginia State Capitol. So this should be of interest to all people. But the Virginia State Capitol National Historic Landmark nomination was written in the 1960s. And the official title of the Virginia State Capitol was actually within the park service records was like the Confederate Capitol. Like that was the official title. It wasn't even called the Virginia State Capitol in the official records of the National Park Service because whoever created that nomination file decided that they were going to focus on this little bit of history. Now they talked about Thomas Jefferson, they talked about this and the next thing, but under their discussion, and their proposal for the Virginia State Capitol to be a national historic landmark is they decided to name it the Capitol of the Confederacy for National Park Service records purposes. So that was one of our case studies. And people were like, oh, this is this is crazy. Why, why is it this way? And in one of our next meetings, we click, quickly went through the process of someone just saying, okay, we just need to rename this. That was more internal dialogue. But the fact of the matter remains is that if you know of, basically it's like any of these national historic landmarks that were created before the 1990s per se, you will find all sorts of tilted history, all sorts of narratives. You're like, okay, really? This is, so this is what you're talking about when you decide to call this a national historic landmark. Um, People can, the National Historic Landmark nomination forms are being digitized. They're about 2,500 National Historic Landmarks. Um, so they're not all available and accessible, but for the most part, they are the 
Park Service's official records on a site. Um, and quite frankly, yeah, you can say this nomination needs to be updated. You can look for funds to do that work yourself, you know, if that's something that you're interested in doing. You don't have to do it just out of passion. You, you should get someone to pay you. The Park Service has grants. Various organizations have grants to do that kind of work. And Jessica said that would be an awesome class project. Uh, my colleague Carla Yanni actually did, she was nominating uh, or updating the nominations for the Rutgers University campus. So that was a class that we had at Rutgers teamed up with the public history program where the students looked at these old nomination forms for Queens College or whatever else and updated them. So, yes. So Rebecca Choi has a, um, is wondering if you had any thoughts on a preservation practice that captures social history and architectural history for buildings that no longer stand, but hold significance in a way that a plaque or a commemorative object doesn't do justice. Well, I've been working with folks. Um, you mentioned Monument Lab. Um, I don't remember if you mentioned Collocate, right? Who have created a practice out of this, this absence and thinking about new ways. And it's mainly public history, um, inventive public history, collaborative public history, uh, you know, that moves beyond the notion of plaques um, that hopefully also influences future, pro um, future practices for public history and preservation. So, the funny thing about this is with the Muskogee, Oklahoma example in particular, the University of Oklahoma School of Architecture actually picked Arrowhead Mall as an architectural studio project. You know, how to put life back into this dead mall. And I looked over the, the material, being the architectural historian I am, and I felt so dissatisfied with the program. And this is not, this is not a, you know, kind of diss for OU School of Architecture, but to be quite frank, I think probably most schools of architecture would have handled the site the same way. They're like, oh, how can we re-enliven this dead mall and perhaps acknowledge the community that was once here? And it's like, yeah, have a mural. And I was like, this does nothing for me. <laughs> <laughs> like the mural is absolutely nothing for me. Um, and so I just, I felt so dissatisfied, but I'm not going to say OU is different from any other school that might have tried to do the same thing. Maybe we need to change the zoning and to, to allow more uses in the mall or, you know, and I was like, forget that. How about the fact that, you know, the mall was put on top of a Black business district and neighborhood? How about zone specific uses in the mall for black businesses. How about, you know, I'm like, do, do the kind of programs within the mall that makes sense to not only the history that was lost, but the vitality of the community. Like, what are you like really saying here? Um, and so, yeah, it's, there's, there's much more to it than just the plaque. And as someone who has seen that change for his hand, like the plaque doesn't do anything for me. Mm -mm. Um, there's another question from Tara Dudley who says that she really enjoyed learning more about your experiences and hearing your perspective on preservation of African American historic sites. She has several questions that are related. Do you know when the National Park Service added ethnic heritage to the areas of significance? And in general, how might the 1970s National Historic Landmark work have been related to the nominating or not nominating of African American sites to the National Register of Historic Preservation. And finally, should preservation practicer, practitioners, educators, students pursue amending NLH and our HP nominations on a large scale to include or make more rich narratives of ethnic heritage significance? So I'm glad for all these questions, Tara. Hey, girl, hey. Um, let's see. Ethnic heritage began, so it's funny actually the bicentennial and the work of the DeForest brothers and African Afro American Bicentennial Corporation um, kind of kicked that off. And 
I think it's just amazing because again, in the vast amount of work that they did in surveying sites in creating narratives, they included the Carter G. Woodson House, which was like black history, like the, the, the father of black history. Um, and so it's kind of cyclical in that way. Uh, so the 1970s is where you see it starting, but things like as, I kind of think of it as like a civil rights movement for historic preservation. So, you know, the black history happens first and then that gets a toe in for Latino, Latinx history and then women's history. And then, you know, as, as society progresses and we become more informed LGBTQ initiative and Asian American Pacific Islander, that, like that's really kind of how it happened. So even in the, the 90s, we were still developing and obviously in the early 2000s, these kind of heritage studies because what they did is they created this national framework, a national narrative that you could say that your site fits into. So instead of having to have individual people come in and create these narratives anew on their own, you can say this site fits into this larger arc of Asian American Pacific Islander history as outlined by the theme study that was published in 20 something, right? So when I was doing even the, the Woodson one, I was saying it fits into the civil rights history because the National Park Service decided they were to have a civil rights theme. And I said, yeah, this is exactly in there. Um, so in some ways the Park Service staff, like the full-time people are trying to create a kind of narrative where we can plug into in the different places we are in the States. But on the other hand, it's still, you know, this kind of pushback. It's like, well, it fits in the narrative, but I don't agree that this fits with the standards of integrity because X, Y, Z. So it's really, there's, there's conflict within the program itself. Um, and so that's, that's one issue. Let's see. So the 1970s work, actually the, the Forrest brothers, who I, I would love to know more about, um, created an institute, the African American Institute for Historical Research in DC, and they continued a partnership with the Park Service for 20 some odd years, right? So the bicentennial is over, can't really call it the Afro American Bicentennial Corporation anymore, but instead they created a new institute to do this kind of research in the vast majority of Black history sites that were nominated as, you know, that were nominated as National Historic Landmarks and are listed on the National Historic. National Register of Historic Places, um, that framework, that groundwork was done by the DeForest brothers and continued up into the 90s. And yes to the last question. So we had some other folks, Jessica asked and um, Geneva asked to absolutely, these are great projects that people can be working on in class. Like I said, my colleague Carla Yanni did it in partnership with our public history program at Rutgers. Um, so if you want to know how she did it, you can email her and she can tell you, don't you all do it at once because she might get mad at me. Looks like there's a comment from one of your students. <laughs> um, and maybe this, this might be our last question from Antonio Pacheco. Can the Historic American Building Survey, perhaps in conjunction with a potential new Green Deal, be instrumentalized to bring ethnically, culturally diverse and significant sites into the public consciousness and inscribe these sites into the public record? Yes, Antonio, thank you. Two lanes full of our picture. Um, yes, right, so once upon a time, Four years ago, in fact, I had dreams of something exactly like that. <laughs> I had dreams. Um, I actually wrote a short essay um, in, uh, get this, uh, a collection. I can't even think of it right now because I'm tired, but um, a historic preservation collection edited by Max Page um, and Marla Mir Miller that said, we need a new new deal, specifically thinking about HABs, right? 
and we need to redocument some of the sites that or, or at least look into the sites that we had previously recorded, but also, yeah, have widespread knowledge um, and, and apply the training that people receive in architecture school into these larger projects. Like we need major infrastructure projects um, and preservation can go right along with that. And it was something that I was actually kind of hopeful for, for a while, but uh, we, we aren't really seeing it right now in terms of this administration and who knows about the next administration. So I think that that is exactly the kind of program that we need. Um, because this that will be a surefire mechanism uh, to ensure that these histories are not lost and or provide that fundamental framework for thinking about how the areas could be rehabbed and renovated and, and you know new uses. So that's that's absolutely an important aspect to this. Thank you so much. Amber. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, thanks for being willing to come to um, the school twice in one day <laughs> and for two different events. Um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation and seeing what happens next. Maybe we can get you back to talk about um, Berry Farms in more elaborated moment. So yeah. thank you so much. I don't know how I thought I was going to do all that. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to say, oh, bending the future, 50 ideas for the next 50 years of historic preservation um, is the book where I talk about the potential for like a new deal with preservation. So it's a great optimistic note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. <laughs>